That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the Bible, all right? And um, here at New Hope, just so you know, uh, we, that's what we teach on. We teach through books of the Bible. We want you to understand God's Word and the Scriptures. And as we start this series that we're digging into the very first book of the whole Bible, which is the book of Genesis. Everybody say that word with me. Genesis. It's the beginnings, right? And, uh, and so we're talking about God's star story and our beginnings, right? As we are going to look at this entire book. Now, this morning, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to actually start in Genesis. We're going to start actually with the whole Bible. I'm going to teach you the whole Bible in about 40 minutes. Awesome? All right. Um, if you've been around here at New Hope, this, what I'm going to teach is not new, but it's a good refresher. Those of you who are new to New Hope, um, awesome. You get to, you're going to get some really awesome um, stuff this morning, okay? Now, I want to encourage you. We actually have the full reading guide now for you. All right, last week we had just a little bookmark, and now we've got the full one. So you probably sat on it. If you sat on it, you're warming up for later. Awesome. Keep it. Um, that one is for sure yours, all right? So uh, don't leave that one when you leave, all right? Um, but th- we offer these. This is a series guide, and this is how we can help you get into God's Word, spend time in prayer with God throughout your week, okay? If you just come and you, what we'd say, come and eat on Sundays alone, you're going to starve the rest of the week. We don't want you to. We want you to feed yourself into God's Word and prayer and time with Him every single day. And, uh, and with that, you're going to see God start to change things in your life. You're going to see Him start to respond in prayers and answer those prayers. You're going to see just awesome things happen as you do that, okay? And so, um, so I would encourage you to grab one of these. It has what we call the SOAP method on one side, which is you go through could take 10 minutes, could take an hour. It just depends on how you want to do it. And read the scripture that we have listed, and then you make um, an observation of that scripture, what kind of pops out to you, what, what word or phrase kind of sticks out to you, because you're asking the Holy Spirit, reveal your word to me. Application is the A, like, so what does this mean for me? What do I do with this? Or how do I live differently this week because of this? And the P is prayer. You talk to God. He wants to hear how you're doing, and, and um, he wants to respond to your prayers as well and work. And so that's on one side, and the other side is actually the reading plan. It's also on our website. It's on our mobile app. It's all over the place. So you can um, go to mynewhope.tv forward slash Genesis if you want to and do it online. Now, with it, there's also, what do we have on the bottom every week? It's a memory verse, right? Because we want to hide God's Word in our head so it moves to our hearts and it changes how we live with our hands, right? And that's the way Scripture does. It's, it changes the way we think. And when we change the way we think, it penetrates our hearts. It changes who we are. And then when we're changing who we are, we start to live and look more like Christ. We look different, right? And so we want you to memorize God's Word. Now, this morning, I'm not going to read a passage. Um, normally, we start that way because I have so much to cover, and I'm going to be doing lots of different passages this morning. I just want us to do the memory verse this morning, okay? Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay, so here's the first memory verse, and it's a long one. Some of you are like, why is it so long? Because we've got a lot of weeks, okay? So you can memorize part of it and just keep adding to it, you know, as you, as you memorize this. This is 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, and, um, and this is the power of God's Word, okay? So let's read this out loud all together. Everybody ready? Yep, all right. That was not convincing. Everybody ready? Yeah. Woo, there we go. All right, here we go. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What's the goal? So that you can be thoroughly equipped, meaning fully, you have all the tools that you need for your spiritual life with God to do what? Every good work, like all the works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. And how do we get there? We read Scripture. It's God's Word for us, right? And, uh, and so we want to understand it. We want to learn and grow in it. Now, I don't know if any of you <clears throat> have ever felt clueless in a conversation before. Has that ever happened to you before? Like, for a long time, I didn't know much about sports. I, I didn't grow up. My dad wasn't in the sports. Like, I didn't play any sports. And so I'd hang out with guys that knew sports, and we'd be watching a football game. And now, I, again, like, I, I didn't know terms. I would, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you just wanted to them to think that you knew, you know, what they were talking about, like, like, and so, like, I remember, like, one game we were watching, he said, oh, that was a touchback, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, I saw that guy touch that guy's back, yeah, like, like, and they're like, it's not what that means, right, like, I know what it means now, I've grown a little bit in understanding what that is, but, like, there's times like that where we feel clueless about a conversation with somebody else, they're talking, and just like, I have no idea what they're saying, but I don't want to look stupid, so I'm, oh, yeah, 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 right, so, anybody do that before, right, now, here's the thing, 
here at New Hope, at, at church, when you come to church on a Sunday and the pastor's up here and he's like reading all these Bible verses and you're like, I don't know, what is he saying? I don't even understand what he's saying or where's that Bible verse? And then you're like, have this giant book in front of you. You're like, this is overwhelming. And, and then you go into maybe a Bible study with other people and they're like, oh yeah, that's in this book or and that's in, oh yeah, in this one. And you feel just like, I don't even know like where to begin. And you feel overwhelmed because it's like, they know stuff I don't. Has anybody ever felt like that, right? So um, I felt like that. For a long time, I felt like that, overwhelmed by this thing that we have called the Bible that we read and study. Now here, no, we don't want anybody to feel that way, okay? The reality is all of us are different places, and we want you to understand the story of God's Word, okay? And so that way you don't feel like you're like, you're either ignorant or you just don't know. We want you to understand the whole story. And this morning, that's my goal. My goal for you is if you don't know the Bible— that when you leave this morning, you'll feel more confident in understanding the whole story of the Bible. Okay? Does that sound it's easy to do, all right? I'm, I'm going to do it this morning. And, uh, and so if you've got your worship programs, you're going to see that I filled in a lot of blanks for you, all right? Um, <clears throat> I only have really one fill in the blank, and, and we want you to understand God's Word. Here's what the Bible is. If I can push the button with my right hand. The, this is the Bible. The Bible is God's story... And it reveals God to me, and it reveals me to me. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's story. It reveals God to me, meaning he's revealed himself already. God has shown us who he is, and we have it in in multiple ways. One, we have it in the scriptures. He's already spoken, and we already know because it is written, right? We know it also because of the person Jesus Christ. He lived, he walked, he was here. And Jesus revealed God in heaven. And now we know it because we live in the time of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's in us as Christ followers. So we have all the revelation we need to know God. Isn't that awesome? And so God isn't hiding himself. He has presented himself. And so when we look at Scripture, it is God's story. We're seeing God's story, and it reveals God to me, so he's shown himself, but it also reveals me to me. There's something about God's Word that also the Holy Spirit uses to show me, to me, who I really am, who I am in Christ, who I am in my identity. It also shows where I need to grow, the parts of me that need to be removed, that that aren't helpful and useful, that are actually more sinful. Like all of that revelation is in Scripture. And that is a powerful, powerful thing that we get to experience when we read and study God's Word. Now, let me help you understand the Bible here real quick. Excuse me, I'm still recovering from my cold, all right? If you can hear, I'm a little nasally. Um, so this is the Bible, okay? The Bible is actually not just one book. It is, you know, with one book that we have it today that we call the Scriptures the Bible, but it's actually 66 separate books that were written by 40 different writers, but there's only one author, and his name is God, okay? So these, these writers were writing, and as they were writing, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, meaning God giving the Holy Spirit to, to bring his word to us. They were either writing this historically, what was happening, what God was doing in that season. There's lots of different parts of Scripture that, that show us what these writers were writing to write these 66 books. But still, it all tells one story of the author, who is God himself. When you think about the Bible, it's crazy to think about how it was written, because in it, It was written by politicians and farmers and prophets and shepherds and peasants and musicians and poets, tax collectors and fishermen and doctors, like lots of different walks of life, lots of different points of history were all these writers. It was written in um, 13 different countries on three different continents with Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And yet all of that, it still is just one story. That's mind-boggling. I mean, imagine if I got four authors and I said, hey, this is what we want to do as a publishing house. We want to write a, a really awesome book that just, it's a New York best time seller. It's going to be the, one of the best books of the year. And this is what we want you to do. We want all four of you to just go away. Don't talk to each other. Don't even like, you know, email, text, nothing. And just go away to a cabin by yourself for a year. And I want you to write whatever you feel like you should write. Okay, and then, and then whenever we're done writing and all of you four in your different locations, we're going to bring it back and just whatever you wrote, we're going to put it and it's going to be one book. Now, do you think that book would be a good book? 
No, it wouldn't make any sense because all those four different writers are having different ideas and different concepts. It should be a fiction or nonfiction or should I write about this or that? And and then they're coming and bringing it together. It's going to be a jumbled mess. It's not going to make any sense at all. So when you think about the likelihood of 44 or 40 different writers writing 66 different books over a time period of 1,500 years, what are the chances of that book making any sense? None unless there's one author. His name is God. God has revealed himself in his scriptures. That is why for us, we believe God, God, the scriptures are God's inspired word. It is God's actual word for you. And, and in this, we're going to learn today the overarching story of this whole story of God and how we fit into it. Now, I want to I show you something, because when we're talking about Bibles, it can, be, can get really confusing, too, even like with English Bibles, because there's lots of different kinds of Bibles that you can go buy, and lots of different translations, and so like this is just a sampling. This is a kind of a cool chart to help you understand translations, because um, I don't know what translation you use whenever you read your Bible. Like, you know, some people use different ones, and here at New Hope, we use specific ones when we teach for specific reasons, and so I wanted to teach you then how does this work when I'm reading my Bible, or how do the different translations work? Because one Bible might say something a little bit different than another Bible in English. Well, what's going on there? If it's God's Word, what's happening? So, so let's, let's understand it, okay? Is everybody cool with this? Yep. All right, and you can screenshot this, take a picture if you want to. Um, there is different types of translations. Any Bible that is not written in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek is a translation, <laughs> Because all the original languages were Greek, you know, or uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Anybody read uh, Hebrew? Anybody can read Hebrew? All right. No. Anybody uh, Aramaic? Like, okay, a little bit. We got a little bit over here. All right, so awesome. Um, anybody, like, cool with Greek? You know, it's all Greek to me, right? Like, so, like, you know, so some, awesome. You've probably studied, you've studied languages. Rock on. Um, most of us have not. So if I gave you a Greek Bible, you'd be like, yeah, it's all Greek to me. Like, I have no idea. So for us, when we get a Bible that's in English, it's been translated from those original language into English so that we can read it, we can understand it, right? And so when we see this, there's different ways that those translations happen to get from those original languages to the ones we use today. And so this is kind of a a spectrum of, of how different groups translated the Bible. You have over here on the far side, what I would say is word for word translations, meaning they, they took the original word in the original language and did their absolute best to bring it to the actual English word that matches or English phrase that matches that word um, so that it's, it's a very accurate translation, right? So these type of Bibles that are word for words translations are usually the ones you would use for like deep study, okay? Because some of the language might be difficult to understand, um, it, some of it can be like you get into King James, right? Thousand these and darts and whatever, and it sounds like a Monty Python episode. But like, um, it can get very hard to understand, even though it's in English. We use this version down here at New Hope, the NASB version, which is the New American Standard Version, which is the closest word-for-word translation from the original Hebrew and Greek. Okay, so if you hear me preaching, if I'm going like deep into study, I'm going to be using the NASB version so I can get as close to that word-for-word translation as I can get to understand the the original intent or the original words of that language. So that's on this spectrum, where you have NASB, ESV, King James, New King James, um, over here on word-for-word. Then you have, going towards the middle, a meaning-for-meaning. So they were trying to get to the closest natural equivalent. So it's like not just words, but what, what was the meaning of that and trying to get that to the word. So it's a little bit more loose from a word for word. And this one, the only one in the middle here is, is the God's word translation is what we have in the middle. And then we have a thought for thought translation. This is where they, they take a functional equ- equivalent. So like they would take a phrase in the original language and take the idea of what that is saying and then take that idea, a thought, and bring that thought into an English explanation of that thought. Does that make sense? So it's not word for word, but it's thought for thought, trying to get it to like, okay, This is how we can easily understand it in our English language today. So thought for thought translations, which is the other one that we use, which is NIV, the New International Version, is more of a thought for thought translation. 
It's easy to understand in English. I wouldn't necessarily use it for a deep study Bible, but I would use it for just a normal, you know, prayer time and that kind of stuff. Study. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's easy to understand. And you have some other ones like the NLT over here, um, the, the CSB uh, versions down here. And then you go all the way to the far end over here, and this isn't necessarily a translation as more of a paraphrase. So this is somebody's idea of what that scripture is trying to say, okay? So it's usually like one or two people. Rather, over here, you have like a huge group of people doing translations, right? And lots of theologians working on that and coming to meetings and having meetings about all that kind of stuff. Down here at Paraphrases, it's going to be a little bit different, like all the way down here. If you've ever heard the Message Bible, Message by um, Eugene Peterson, took the Bible, and he did study it in the original languages, but then he wrote his words to what he thinks that would mean for us today. So it's a very simplified version of Scripture, but still, it's interesting to read, to, to gain some understanding of what that passage might be saying if you're confused about it, okay? So does this make sense? So you kind of have different types of translations that you would use for different reasons, okay? I would say if you're hanging around over here in Thought for Thought and NIV, that's what we usually use to teach in, you're fine. Like, that's, that's awesome. If you're going deeper study, I would come over here to a word-for-word -word translation like the NASB or ESV, and I would use that connected to like a concordance or like Strong's where you can actually look at the original Greek word or look at the original Hebrew word. For me, I'm a tech geek, okay? So I use technology and software to do this, um, and I've had people ask me, what do you use to study? I use this uh, software called Olive Tree. It's a, it's a it's actually free, and then you can buy Bibles to add to it, but all I have to do is click one verse. It takes me NASB. I click on it. It takes me to the Greek. Literally, like in seconds, I can go deep, right? And so those tools are helpful. If you love books, you can have a desk full of books, all right? And, and you can do it that way physically. I know um, that Jim is more of the book guy, so he loves having all the books spread out on his desk. And so any way you do that, that's fine. So this is how the Bible was translated for us in English, okay? Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah. All right, good. At least the front half, it's helpful. I don't know about the back half, y'all Y'all with me? Back there, all right, just a little nods. Okay, awesome. So with this one story, here's the amazing thing, this whole, the whole Bible with this one story, it is full of so many different things for us to understand who God is. There's history books, right, which, which we're gonna be reading in the book of Genesis. It's more like a history book. There's genealogies, which is the exciting part. Just lists of names, right, which actually gives us the history in these genealogies of names you try to pronounce. There's eyewitness accounts. There's parables and stories. There's prophecy. There's poetry and songs. And then there's letters to the early church and the early leaders. And so there's different types of books as you read them. So when you're reading it, you can understand, okay, what is the context of this book? Who's the author? And, um, and why were they writing this, right? So you, that helps you go deeper into understanding each book as you study it. But the whole thing put together is the story of God. And honestly, the whole story is the story of God's redemption of us. It's God redeeming us. That's the whole story, okay? So I've got 25 minutes to go from Genesis to Revelation, okay? <clears throat> Everybody ready? You already did the one fill in the blank. The Bible's God's story reveals God to me and me to me. So we're going to do this. This is my little diagram. You already have it in your notes. Um, all right. So I, I filled it in for you. Okay. This is the whole story of the Bible. And so we're going to start here and work our way over here. Um, so that, and the reason we're doing this as an intro to, to um, Genesis, because I want us to understand the full story, because when we read the beginning, we understand how the beginning fits into the whole story. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why we're doing this this morning as we talk about it. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with the word creation. Now, I have lines next to each of these words, I think, for you, and you're going to write in the passage is what I want you to write on the line. I'm going to tell you to write next to those words. And so the first word is creation. Everybody say that word with me. Creation, creation all right? And that's Genesis 1 and 2, all right? Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It's so funny when we think about, of Genesis, we think, oh yeah, that's the creation story. And it's only the first two of 50 chapters, okay? So like Genesis, there's a lot in there, okay? Um, <clears throat> as we read it. So, but in the beginning, it is. It's the story of creation. And, and God created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is a great creator. He's a creative creator. We still see his creativity today, don't we? Like when you go on a walk in nature, it's like, whoa, like God, you are so crazy. Even like down to the little tiniest bug that has a certain pattern on it. I'm like, God, you are so crazy in your creation. 
and how beautiful that is to the complexity of us, how he made us. It's God is a creative creator. And so in the beginning, he created all of that, created the heavens and the earth, but his main creation was us. That was his desire, was for people. And so he created Adam. And then the phrase was, it's not good for man to be alone. So he created Eve. And then Eve showed up and Adam named her. He was like, whoa, man, right? That was the first sight he had. That was a joke. All right, this is weak. Weak jokes. And so this is, what, this, is, this is what God created them to do. He created them to relate, first off, to relate with him in the garden. That's the beautiful picture, and we're going to go deep into this, so I'm just going to go really shallow this morning, but that was his main thing. I want you to relate with me. Adam and Eve, I'm here. I'm walking with you in the garden. And here's the cool thing. You're relating with each other, and you're relating, to, you're relating with each other in perfection. You don't have to argue about anything. You don't have to worry about we're going to eat after work. You're not like like you're just going to always get along. There's the, it's just the perfect garden. I provided everything for you. This is my dream for you, and that is what God did. He put them in that garden to relate with Him and to relate with each other. And then He went to another level because He created them and said, "Now you rule this creation. You're in charge of it. I'm giving you some of my authority." Now that I created it, but now I'm giving you the authority to take care and steward what I've given you in this garden. So you're going to name the animals. You're going to take care of the land. You're going to eat off the land and, and get sustenance from this creation. And so that is your job. It's to relate and to rule. And that is at the very beginning in the book of creation. And it was beautiful. I mean, I can't imagine the beauty of that garden. I can't imagine, like, they were naked and unashamed, right? Like, they knew each other in full intimacy, and there was no guilt, no shame, no nothing. Like, they just, it was perfect until something happened. A certain serpent shows up and tempts Eve. Hey, and here's the temptation. God's withholding something from you. You think he gave you everything, but he didn't. He said, don't eat from that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, but if you eat from this, you'll be like God. Talk about the first temptation. And in that first temptation came in the first word, which is the word brokenness. Because Eve ate from the fruit, and then Adam ate from the fruit, and brokenness entered into the story. The one thing they were told not to do, they did. And now all of a sudden, they were naked and ashamed and they had to go cover themselves up. They ran away from God, and God came to the garden and said, where are you? He knew where they were, but he's, he's wanting them to come to him. He says, where are you? And all of a sudden, this is what happens. Sin entered in. God is a God of love and a God of free will, and he was from the very beginning in the garden. They had a choice to love him and to trust him, and they wanted something more and in that sin, and this is what still sin does today, sin broke relationship with God. And sin broke relationship with each other. This moment of this beauty and perfect in creation where they were relating to God and each other and ruling over creation all changed when brokenness came in. So you can write next to brokenness Genesis 3, okay? Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> this is where it all started. This is why... We go through the things we go through because brokenness is still in the world today. Yes, and, um, and with that comes cancer and illness and crime and greed and hatred. And, and we're going to read the book of Genesis and we're going to see it all, all right? We're going to see all the messiness of creation, all the messiness of free will in there. And we're going to see ourselves in this story when brokenness came in to the story of humanity. And this garden experience in the first and the beginning um, could not go back to, to that way again than when it entered. So, so then from brokenness in Genesis chapter 3, we see, you know, the people grew and nations came and there was a flood and, and then repopulation. Okay, we're going to talk about that. All right, so but you get to this guy by the name of Abram. And Abram becomes Abraham. And with Abraham, God is trying to get back to this dream. He wants a relationship with people. And he wants to teach him how to rule the land that he gave them. And so comes this thing to Abraham called the promise, all right? The next line is promise. Everybody say that with me. Promise, promise okay? So God gave Abraham a promise. And we've talked about these promises in the past. This is Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. So write that down next to promises. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. We're, we're like three in and we're still in the book of Genesis, right? Like, 
and we only have like so many little notches here to go. <clears throat> this is where we learn about God as the God and his character as the God of promise. When he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. Amen. And so this promise that he gave to Abraham is this. In Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he says to him, and I will make you a great nation, which is kind of interesting because by this time, Abram was already a little up in years, okay? And he just had a small family, and it's like, how are we going to become a nation? We're just a small thing. He said, no, God wants to do that, okay? <clears throat> he says, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, which is interesting because if you go anywhere on this planet and you ask anybody in a religion, have you ever heard of this guy by the name of Abraham? Everybody would say, yeah, I've heard of him, right? There's whole other religions attached actually to the lineage of Abraham that isn't Christianity. Like Abraham's name is great. God kept, kept his promise. He's a promise-keeping God. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a promise that Abraham had no idea what the heck God was talking about. We're going to learn what he was talking about, that promise that God gave, because this begins the lineage that is still our lineage today as Christ followers. Started right here in these promises that God picked this guy off the side of a desert saying, you're it. You're my guy. I'm picking you and your family. And he gave them these promises. Now, <clears throat> we know that God continued to to do what he promised later on. Abraham, in his old age, had a son named Isaac, Isaac then had a son named Jacob, who eventually Jacob's name got changed to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons started to become the 12 tribes of Israel, and the nation started being born. That is now Israel, the Jewish lineage, right? And so God kept those promises until it got to Joseph, and we're going to talk about Joseph. He's the end of the book of Genesis, okay? And Joseph moved into Egypt, and he became a crazy leader in Egypt, and then all the family moved into Egypt, and then 400 years went by, right? And we talked about that in the last series in the book of Exodus. Unfortunately, as the Jews grew up in Egypt, they became a slave nation underneath Pharaoh and the Egyptian nation through that experience, which is unfortunate. And God was like, that was not my intent for you. And so, if you know the story, God picked a guy, his name was Moses, Big Mo, and said, let my people go. Go in there, right? Like, Big Mo, let my people go. It rhymes, all right? So you can remember it. Um, and so Moses did that. He went to Pharaoh, said, Pharaoh said no, over and over and over again, right? The whole plagues came until finally the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. And he said, finally, get out of here. Leave immediately. And they left. They went across on Red Sea. See, I'm going through this quick. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So he's, now they're this whole nation, which is now millions of people, fleeing this land of Egypt to go to the promised land, which was a part of the blessing and the promise that God gave Abraham. Your people will own this land. This will be your land. And so there they started on that journey. Now, on that journey, we saw Moses, and now this, could, imagine being Moses. Hey, here's a million people in the desert. What? What are we doing with these people, right? Have you ever been camping? <laughs> have, have you ever gotten grumpy camping? Just wondering, right? All right, so imagine 40 years of camping, all right? So that's what was going on in this season with the Jews. And they were, they were getting grumpy. But in this moment, as they were going out, God wanted his people to understand him. And, 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 and this is what he said. I want them to understand how to relate with each other, and I want them to understand how to relate with me. It's like going back to the garden. He created them to relate with each other, relate with God, and to rule the land. And he's trying to get them back to it trying to get them back to it, which moves us into the next part, which is called the law. Moses met with God face to face in this season, and he climbed the mountain, and God was there, and God, with his own hands, etched onto these stone tablets the Ten Commandments, and these Ten Commandments were there to help them to learn how to relate with God and relate with each other. That's the Ten Commandments. If you read them, you'll say, oh yeah, that is what it's about. He said, like, have no other gods but me. Don't worship any other gods. Don't have any idols. Like, I want to be your God. I'm jealous for you. Now, don't kill each other, right? Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Like, all that stuff. And she's like, this is how you get along. This is how I want you to get along. And he's trying to get them back to the dream of the garden. 
And so right next to uh, the word law, write Exodus 20, okay? Exodus chapter 20. This is Moses and the Ten Commandments. Have, who's ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Just show your hand if you've ever heard of the Ten Commandments. Sorry. Okay. Most people have heard about the Ten Commandments. Um, <clears throat> I think it's still a part of God's promise that he gave to Abraham as he's preparing that. So the story continues. Unfortunately, they still, even in the desert, they saw God's miracles, but they were still grumpy about God. And I, and I get it, camping's hard, right? So like they, they weren't in the promised land yet. Then they get to go spy on the land that God said, I'm gonna give you. And so these 12 spies go into that land and God's like, this is the land I wanna give you. And they come back, give report to Moses and, and they're like, I don't know if we can do this. 10 of the 12 said, there's giants in the land. Yeah, the fruit's good. Everything's like, it is flowing with milk and honey. I mean, it sounds sticky, but delicious, right? Like it's just, a, it's a great place you wanna, we would love to be there, but there's fortified cities with giant walls and there's literally giants in the land. I don't think we can do this. Two of the spies came back and said, but God told us we can do this. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, we can do this. And yet they chose to not start the journey that God called them for. They disobeyed. And so when, he, when they disobeyed, God said, well, fine. This generation will never see that promised land. And they had to wait 40 years until that generation passed away. Until then Moses died and Joshua became the leader. And then they started walking in the promised land, okay? So now they're walking and now they're battling other nations to take over the land. God called them to take over and they flourish. They they. They continue to grow. The nation grows. You get into Jerusalem, right? The, the city that God says, you know, the temple's built there. God's presence is with them. All, lots of good stuff happening, okay? But unfortunately, some other things happen because they start seeing other lowercase g gods and idols from other nations that they're taking over, and they start kind of pulling them in to add to their God. And they start worshiping other lowercase gods, and they start having families with foreigners, which God told him not to do. And, and so God said, I told you I'd be with you as long as you're with me. And we move into the season that's called rebellion. Okay? Rebellion. You can, you can write down next to rebellion, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9. Okay? Nehemiah, chapter 9, verses 26 to 28. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a part of our free will and human condition that has this desire to lead ourselves without God. And you see this all now through the story of the Old Testament. Really, you're going to see it over and over and over again through the rest of the Old Testament. God's people are going to be with God and they're going to worship God and they're going to have worship in the temple and the priests are going to be doing what they're supposed to and then they're going to start to worship other gods. They're going to forget about the law and then God's going to say, I can't be with you any longer. And then people come in and then God allows people to come in and battle against them and they lose and then they come back to God and they repent and they go oh there's the scriptures and they come back to God and God says awesome and then God comes back to them and now they're rejoicing because they found the law until they find another lowercase g God and another idol to worship and, the, and this cycle just happens over and over and over again this rebellious spirit that keeps cycling through God sends judges to them God sends prophets to them they kill the prophets right like God's trying to get their attention the whole time because he's like this is not my dream for you my dream is still the garden for you to relate with each other and me and to rule in, in a beautiful picture. And yet your rebellious spirit continually pulls you away from me and the dream I have for you over and over and over again. So we get to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is trying to bring the people back to Jerusalem after they've been in Babylon, which is a, a, a secular society, worshiping the occult and all sorts of low-case G gods and idolatry and all sorts of stuff, okay? And so that they got taken away from their land. And now there's this slow coming back. I think it was Ezekiel first came back, right? And then, and then Nehemiah. And, <coughs> excuse me, and Nehemiah is trying to rebuild the temple and bring his people back to Jerusalem, to the city of God. And in this, we see Nehemiah say this. Um, he says, but they, talking about God's people, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them 
But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven, you heard them, and in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out, and you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. Welcome to the Old Testament. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a, it's, it gets messy in there, guys. If you don't think the Bible's interesting, read the Bible. Like, there's some interesting stuff that happens inside. I mean, it's not G, all right? This is it's rated R stuff, okay? Lots of things that happen in this season of rebellion. And then at the end of this season of rebellion, you see that the Jews who are religious have gotten super religious to the point where they have gotten only religious and they actually didn't let God into the religion. It became legalism. Live by this law and that law and this law and this law and that law and they would judge people who didn't do it and, and they, they, they remember the stories of the Old Testament and they remember Exodus and the promises of Abraham and they remember God saving their people and, and celebrating Passover and, and they remembered these things but it was more about a religion. And God was like, still, this is not the dream I had for them. They're relating me thinking they got to prove themselves to me. And that's not what it was in the garden. You with me? Everybody with me? And so we get to one of the best words in the story, and it's the word grace. Because God was about to do something different. He said, this isn't what I want and I've been preparing them. I've been prophesying. I, the prophets have been telling them, I'm sending a Messiah. I'm sending someone who's going to save them. Many of the Jews thought that was a political savior to come free them from Rome. But that's not what God was doing at all. He was sending them someone to save them from their sin. So they could experience God's perfect grace. And so enters into the story, Jesus. This is where the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John come in. It's the story of God sending his one and only son through a miraculous birth. You know, you know Mary, we're going to celebrate during Christmas, all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> a miraculous birth, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, and then God's own son, Jesus, being born in a miraculous way. And then him growing up, living perfect. I mean, Jesus never sinned. He was both man and he was both God. He was led by the Holy Spirit, and as he was led by the Holy Spirit, we see through the Gospels how we too can live just like Christ lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became our example, our model of what it looks like in the kingdom of heaven and how we ought to live and how we ought to look and how the kingdom of heaven operates. And then he finished God's plan by saying, I now will be the final sacrifice once and for all for everyone, for the forgiveness of their sins. And that's what Jesus did. He died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Meaning the rebellion, the law, the promises, the brokenness have a new story for us in grace. We have access to God's grace every single day. And so this is God reaching down to us through his son to pull us up. This is... Um, this is what it says in 1 John. So you can write this down next to grace. 1 John 1, 6 and 17. Write down 1 John 1, 16 and 17. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is what it says. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. That's awesome. Christ was the fulfillment Christ was the fullness of God making us right before him. For the law was given through Moses, right? The law. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Which would you rather live under, the law or grace and truth? Which one? Grace and truth. Amen, right? To live under the law is to live under oppression. Even the Jews, like, all, all of a sudden now, all these Gentiles, these non-religious, um, were coming to know this Jesus receiving the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And so these Jews who were accepting Jesus as their Messiah were saying, what do we do? 
We thought this was just for us, and now we're seeing, no, this is for everyone. Going back to the promise to Abraham, all peoples will be blessed through you, Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was the seed of the Messiah, Jesus, who came to become the one that blesses everyone. And now we all get to experience not the law, but grace and truth in Christ Jesus. We get to experience that in where we are now. And this thing got born, this thing called the body of Christ, this thing called the church. Jesus rose again. Woo! He conquered death. Forgiveness of sin. We can die to our sin, be forgiven of our sin, and we can have real life and eternal life because he is alive. Amen? Amen? And that is the gift of God's grace. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough to get to it. God's grace is the only way that we can experience that kind of salvation because he sees us beyond our sinfulness and invites us back to the dream to relate with him and to relate with each other and to rule what we've been given, to steward it well. And that is our call still today. That is, is his dream still today. And we live in the time now, what is, which is called the time of the Spirit. Right? Write down, um, <clears throat> under Holy Spirit, write down John 14. John chapter 14, verse 16. See, this is, this is where we you see in the New Testament now the book of Acts and then the letters to the church, all right? This is the season of the Holy Spirit because Jesus ascends and he says, but don't worry, when I ascend back into heaven, it's good for you because I'm asking my father for something. And this is what he, he was telling his disciples in John 14. In verse 16, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another capital H helper, not lowercase helper, capital H helper, talking about the Holy Spirit, so that he may be with you forever. Then down to verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you how many things? All things. And he will remind you of all that I said to you. The Holy Spirit has been given. <clears throat> and that was the birth in the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts, you're going to see the Holy Spirit all over it. That's how the church grows. The Holy Spirit does this thing. He starts coming into people. He starts calling people in the salvation. The Holy Spirit is God himself working amongst us and in us and through us. And the Holy Spirit does so many things for us. That's a whole other sermon, all right? But I'm so grateful. We live in the time of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in us as Christ followers. And that we get to walk into all that he's given us, that we can be reminded of everything he said to us, that we can be gifted the things that God puts inside of us to bless and do spiritual things that only God can do through us, like this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is a good counselor. And I, I would say right now, the Holy Spirit is the, the part that reveals us to us through God's word. So we get to the Spirit. Now, now if you're looking at the timeline of the Bible, <clears throat> where are we in the timeline? We're right here. All this is already done. When you read your Bible, you need to understand we're in the last days. We're waiting for something. And you read it all through the New Testament as they were writing to the early church. Can't wait for the capital D day. And that capital D day is when we're talking about eternity, Christ's return. God putting back what he originally intended in the garden. And this whole thing that he's doing with the eternity, I'm going to read it in a moment, is that he wants to create a place for us to relate with him and with each other again in perfect relationship. That is his dream, and he's going to put us back into that. In the beginning, it was a garden. In the end, it's a city. It's called New Jerusalem. And in that city, Christ will be with us. God himself will be with us and us with him. And no more sin or brokenness or dying or death. It's all done. Excuse me. And so we read this. <clears throat> we read this in the last series, but I want to read it again because this is the end of the story, the last chapter, Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We're, part, we're that city as Christ followers. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Does it not sound like the garden? He will put it all back. We long for that day. We wait for that day. 
Because we are still in the land of brokenness, but we get to walk in the Spirit. Let me keep reading. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer, uh, there will no longer be any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Said, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. This is the story of God. The Bible is the story of God. And the main theme of that story is God rescuing us. Rescuing us back to put us in a garden. And while we're on this earth, he's still trying to help us to live into his dream, to relate with him, to relate with each other, and to live and steward and rule the things he's given us. And he's given us everything we need in his scriptures through the power of his Holy Spirit to live that kind of life. This is the story of the Bible. This is why here at New Hope we teach the Bible. We don't teach pop psychology. We don't teach something that makes you feel good when you leave and it's like, yeah, that was neat. I'm not Dr. Phil. (laughs) We need God's word and the Holy Spirit. That's it. You don't need anything else. You don't need a show. You, you, You don't... You don't need entertainment. We, we just need God's word and the Holy Spirit. And we have both. Amen. And so when we're digging into God's word, as we're getting into the book of Genesis, we're going to learn the foundation of God's story. We're going to learn about the characters at the beginning of our story. And we're going to see God as who he really is. And, and we're going to go deep into it, okay? Now, here's the thing. We've got 50 chapters to cover in like eight weeks, so we're not going to read every chapter here on Sundays. On that reading plan, you'll see two things, especially on the right side of your reading plan. You'll see like sections of verses, but at the very top, it'll see read chapters, you know, 26 through 36, right? If you want to go deep and read every chapter, those will be the chapters you read for that week. You can do that if you want to, okay? Because we'll be teaching through all of that, but helping you understand the full story of those chapters. If you just want to read just the verses we give you throughout each day, awesome. Just read those verses and you're good. Okay, and you'll be prepared for what we teach on, on the, the next Sunday. But we want you to get into God's Word. Um, this week, you were probably confused because you're like, Tim, none of these verses are Genesis, right? <laughs> and now you understand why you were reading about the power of God's Word. That's what you re- read this week to get ready for this week because you need to understand God's Word is powerful. Amen. It will never leave and come back without accomplishing what God intended it to accomplish. And so I want to encourage us as a church <clears throat> during this series celebrate what God's given us don't miss out on the richness okay now we're going to take a time to respond and, and sing the song we just learned okay because now that we know the whole story when you sing the words you are the same God what you did then you can do now it means something deeper doesn't it because we get to proclaim The God who created, the God who brought promise, the God who brought the law, even though we rebelled, gave us grace, and now we're full of the Holy Spirit. This same God is doing the same thing here. He is the same God, and he has not changed. We're going to take some time to respond, and we're going to to sing together. So let's just take take a moment. God, thank you for your word. I pray that this has been helpful for people, and and, um, And that you'll use this as an encouragement to us as Christ followers to not take for granted that we have this scriptures in our own language that we can understand and read every day. For generations, people long to have what we have. Yet I feel like so often we take it for granted. Help us to not do that. I want to talk to the Christ followers in the room just for a second, okay? We give you here at New Hope every tool you need to spend time with God. But we cannot control you or make you do anything. I would ask for you here at New Hope as a Christ follower to take a step if you haven't spent time with God during your week to start. You can grab a reading plan. Honestly, if you want to go even deeper, we have journals that are, are soap journals that we use 
They're $10 or $5 at the Welcome Center. If you want something to write in and journal in that way, grab one of those journals. It'll help you in that process. I'm sure you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's free Bibles on the table on the other side of that wall. Grab one, write your name in it, take it home with you, download a Bible app, whatever you need to do. But my challenge this morning is this week, if you haven't been, get into God's Word. Join us in reading together. And let's see what the Holy Spirit does when we meet with Him in His Word. Now, those of you in this room that you don't know Jesus yet, maybe you're coming back to God, maybe, maybe you know that you've been in a season of rebellion. Here's the good news. God's grace is for the rebellious spirit. <clears throat> he wants you to be with Him, and He's inviting you to repent of your sin and come to Him. You can be forgiven. You can walk in a relationship with Him. He's done all of it for you to, to walk with Him. If you don't know Christ today, I would say come to Him today. Make a decision to say, I want that kind of relationship. And if the Holy Spirit's doing something inside of you, I'm going to pray in a moment and they're going to respond in worship. But I'm going to say, if that's you, come to Christ today. Start your relationship today. We read in Romans that all you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and He died for you. And you can be saved. You can start this relating with God and, and each other. You can have the promise of eternity with him. But without it, you don't have any of those things. You're just leading your own life. So today, if you want to have a relationship with him, just pray with me right now. You can say this. Say, God, <clears throat> I, I am a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. So I'm asking, would you forgive me of my sins? Would you heal me? Would you make me new? Would you forgive me now and forever? I believe Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross to pay for my sin. And so I'm asking God, <clears throat> would you enter into my heart? Would you give me your Holy Spirit? Redeem me. Make me new. Give me your peace. I want you to be Lord and lead my life now and forever. And I want to be with you forever and eternity, God. So be my Lord. I trust you are my Savior. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you make any decision on a Sunday, we would love to know about that, okay? And, and you can find one of us afterwards if you want to, or you can just write it on a Connect card and, and put it in the teal box, and we'll be praying for you. We want to send you some stuff to encourage you this week. Um, but take that step. Let's stand together, church, as we take this time to respond and worship. And, and when you sing these words, the God of Jacob,